Good day. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be given this opportunity to speak to you today. I'm sorry I can't be with you directly there in Israel, but I do uh, treasure this opportunity to convey some of our thoughts on game-changing technologies and how the new world's energy challenges will be solved. To start, I'd like to uh, quote uh, the first Energy Secretary of the United States, James Schlesinger, who said, when it comes to America's energy policy, uh, we have only two modes, complacency and panic. I think the good news today is that there may not be so much panic. The uh, advent or the discovery of the vast amounts of natural gas here in the U.S., much like those found at stores off the coast in Israel, actually have the potential to really change the way we think about energy. It doesn't displace our need to do the basic research, to do the long-term technology development, to put in place the low-carbon or zero-carbon producing technologies that will really drive the future of our energy systems. But it is a good news story that gives us an advantage to not panic. But the real challenge then is how do we not become complacent? So let me start by just reminding you, because most people here today do know the challenges. Uh, we have a challenge. Uh, today, um, we consume upwards of 15 terawatts of electricity across the whole world. Uh, the IEA just came out with their World Outlook in 2012 and predicting, of course, a 30% increase by 2035 in that consumption. 60% of that increase is driven by China, India, and even the Mideast. And the question is, how will we meet our demands? You can see here in this picture, of course, a sky view, or it's a, it's a time-lapse photograph, if you will, of the globe where the lights uh, indicate where there's a lot of energy consumption. Of course, there's also a lot of regions on Earth where there isn't a lot of consumption. We just reached 7 billion people, and we're destined to increase that number by another 30% in the next 50 years or so. And that 50% or 30% will consume a large amount of energy. So the question is, how are our future energy demands be met? With, of course, the constraint uh, that the primary source of energy today, being the fossil fuels, produce a lot of carbon. This is a picture from an average day, an average sunny day in downtown Beijing, where you can see the experiment is being run, producing lots of carbon, about 30 gigatons a year. And so the question is, how, as we increase our consumption of energy, do we also put a cap and even reduce the amount of carbon that we produce? So I'd like to start, really, uh, by talking a little bit about a potential strategy for the U.S. Uh, the U.S. Uh, is in a position where, with this new discovery of, of shale gas, if you will, uh, maybe give us some ability to not panic, but there's certainly some things to think about in the context of, of a long-term strategy for an energy economy in the U.S. And this chart, as you can see, shows you uh, on top here the various uses. I'm just expressing this in quads, about 100 quads of energy consumed a year in the U.S., uh, divided up amongst uh, the many different sources, predominantly fossil fuels. Predominantly, it's in the, in the context of petroleum, and coal. But one of the more interesting recent things that have happened is that uh, natural gas, because of the discovery of shale gas, uh, and in fact shale oil, has surpassed uh, coal as a source of electricity and energy in general in the U.S. And even in just in the context of electricity, natural gas has just really since surpassed nuclear energy in the U.S., which was and still is about 20 percent of our electricity supply. So there's a lot of change, still fossil fuels, but a lot of change in what the U.S. is producing in terms of energy sources. I also want to highlight one other thing, which is, which is of course, very important in Israel, which is uh, solar. Today, solar in the U.S. is only about 0.1 percent. It's increasing, but not increasing as fast as one might think. To make a real major change in the, in the source of energy into solar will, of course, take dramatic changes in technology, mostly driven by issues surrounding cost. So then I can show you a little bit of how that uh, energy is used. Uh, first, let's look at electricity. Uh, about 40 percent of the energy produced in the U.S. is used in electricity. As I've already said, nuclear has just been surpassed by natural gas, but you can see the sources, some in petroleum, mostly dominated by coal. Energy consumption uh, is, is roughly divided four ways across transportation, industry, commercial, and, uh, and residential in the U.S. Uh, and then, of course, a lot of that goes into uh, is used. But one thing to note here is that a dramatic amount of the energy that we produce and use gets wasted in in power lines, gets wasted in heat and engines, for example, across the board. So right away you can start signaling what a good uh, new energy economy might look like, and also, importantly, what a strategy might look like in the U.S. to actually deliver on technologies that, that start addressing some of these challenges. So the first is, if we're looking at petroleum and replacing petroleum with a lower carbon producing uh, entity, uh, fuel switching. So switching to biomass, switching to biofuels. 
uh, something which the U.S. is beginning to invest in a big way in, hydrogen-based solutions, uh, but also in terms of uh, electrical energy storage. So one, in the U.S., about a third of our petroleum is consumed in automobiles. And uh, there is a plan, a uh, plan on paper, to transform the U.S. transportation system to electricity, much like in Israel, thinking carefully about this. Just some quick numbers. If the U.S. did it, they would take, uh, reduce the consumption of petroleum by a third, and at the same time reduce the production of carbon by 25 percent across the U.S. So switching to electric vehicles has a tremendous potential. We're not there yet, but it's something to think carefully about. Uh, carbon capture is becoming even more important with, with coal uh, being going to be, coal will be a source for many, many years to come, but with natural gas now looking like it might take up to 40 percent of the U.S. Uh, electricity by 2035 or 2050, carbon capture becomes even more important to consider because even though natural gas is a good source and a lower carbon source, it's only uh, at, the, at the combustion engine side, it's only 50 percent better than, say, petroleum is. So one has to think carefully ab about uh, carbon capture as well. In terms of the other uh, sources of energy that the U.S. Uh, now is currently engaged in, what I call zero carbon, uh, they're distributed in a broad range. Wind has been growing. This, this chart is actually uh, dated now a little bit from 2010. You'll see even better numbers. Wind is now uh, approaching some significant amount of the energy supply. But developing these zero carbon uh, sources is becoming ever more important. And of course, solar is one of those that will benefit greatly from uh, R&D. A smart grid and, and transmission, we just recently had one of the worst storms ever up the East Coast called Hurricane Sandy, shut down a large fraction of the grid. A lot of people believe if we had a smart grid, a much more sensorized grid where we could predict or even measure, know when, when outages occur, we could be much more effective in delivering and conserving our energy. And also, of course, probably most importantly, if you will, it's almost low-lying fruit, uh, taking care of end-use efficiency, building efficiency. Uh, and other places where energy could be dramatically saved, like in engines, where, where a lot of the thermal heat, thermal energy could be used and transferred back into a battery. And lastly, a subject which unfortunately in the U.S. has often been a delicate one and now I think is coming to the forefront is climate science and climate change. And discussing climate change, of course, drives the discussion over carbon footprint and the amount of carbon produced from these energy sources. So what I'd like to do in the next few minutes is talk a little bit about uh, changing the game. How do we change the game in energy? How do we drive a new energy economy? And I'd like to give the one example which I find uh, these days is the most compelling. If, if we were having this conversation five years ago, we'd probably be talking about uh, a, a nuclear renaissance and trying to drive low carbon footprint with nuclear. Today, that game has changed, frankly, with the, uh, with the uh, discovery of shale gas. Now, I want to make a point. Shale gas wasn't discovered uh, just yesterday. And in fact, shale gas has been known for over 100 years, but mostly it's just been burned off at the wellhead. Uh, what's changed is a way of accessing this particular type of gas. Uh, and I want to point out one thing, which is really one of the main themes of my talk, is that, is that shale gas didn't just happen to us. It actually was developed out of very deep research, R&D. Started way back, but driven largely in the 70s by Department of Energy and private partnerships uh, to actually look at how to extract this, this type of, of, of gas uh, directly from the shale, from the rock. Started off with about um, $130 million total of U.S. investment over about 10 years in the 70s, largely through DOE investment and through projects in the 70s like the Eastern Gas Shale Project, which was a public-private partnership. The reason I'm mentioning this is because it was early investment at a time when people thought natural gas was something just to burn off at the wellhead. It was at a time when oil or petroleum was only about $30 a barrel. Crude oil was $30 a barrel. So most people looking at this problem said, why invest anything in natural gas? Well, it turned out the DOE did so, and of course, the rest is history. It's now turning into a, a, a dramatic business for the U.S., and it, it looks now like, uh, like shale gas will go on to uh, grow in consumption. In fact, it's even predicted in the last uh, two weeks ago when the World Outlook uh, 2012 came out, the IEA's World Outlook, it suggested that the U.S. would be entirely energy independent based on shale gas and oil produced over the next 25 years. So it's a remarkable shift in our thinking here in the States, and it will have a major impact here. And I also should mention, of course, in Israel, and I'll come back to that in a minute. The other thing I should mention is that shale gas is not just having an impact on energy supply, but also on greenhouse gas emissions. This is a chart which just shows the year in and year out uh, production of, of carbon uh, from the U.S. I mentioned uh, a number is about 30 uh, gigatons per year produced globally. This is what's just produced by the U.S. 
uh, in the first quarter total CO2 emissions from 1992 to 2012. And the main thing to get from this is, is you see that shale gas is really having a, a, a resounding impact on the amount of carbon we produce. It's not going away because shale gas still does, when it's burned, produces carbon, and when it's, when it's pumped out of the ground, produces methane and other greenhouse gas. But it is driving consumption in the U.S. of carbon, and it's driving it down. And the main reason it's going down is because is the new plants being built in the U.S. are no longer coal plants, but they're now gas plants. And finally, uh, of course, having gas here in the U.S., mostly not exported at the moment. In fact, natural gas is not exported at all. Uh, it's also driven the cost dramatically so that the cost of energy now in the U.S. is, is quite low. And finally, I just want to, of course, don't need to remind you here, is that shale gas is transforming not just the U.S., but around the globe. And, and Israel, of course, has found this tremendous res potential resort. This is a, a picture of the uh, Sedco Express drilling rig above the uh, Tamar gas field which will have a resounding impact on Israel, provided that it's used in a responsible way. So the question now is, I talked a little bit about, uh, about natural gas as a game changer, um, but we can't forget that there are other, certainly other things we need to continue to explore. In my chart, I showed you that, of course, natural gas is growing, but we can't just say that's the end. It still produces a lot of carbon, and it's still a fossil fuel and not infinitely uh, available. There will still be limitations to the amount of that, and we even know roughly what that will be. So how do we develop future game changers and what they, might they look like? And of course, I'm here from a Department of Energy laboratory, uh, Argonne National Laboratories. Um, there are 17 of our national labs, 10 of which are focused on the basic science, the long-term needs associated with, with energy. Uh, and so I just wanted to say a little bit about how we are different and what makes us able to do what we do in thinking about changing the game. So first of all, we do mission-driven science. And what I mean by that is we do science uh, not just blue sky science, although we do some of that, but mostly we do science with a long-term mission, much like Bell Labs or AT&T or even Siemens used to do. We do the kind of long-term research that will impact the future, in, uh, the future of energy. We have world-class researchers, and those researchers are not stovepiped into individual divisions. They are able to work closely across disciplines. So cross-disciplinary teams are key to us and our success. Um, we have people, for example, working on battery research that go from physicists to chemists to engineers all capable not only of doing the fundamental chemistry in a battery, but also understanding how to build a battery and ultimately put it into an automobile. Uh, we have major facilities, so we combine not only great science with a mission, but we also have major facilities. And at Argonne in particular, we have the advanced photon source, which is one of the world's brightest sources of x-rays, to do materials discovery, much like is needed in solar cells or in batteries, et cetera. And we don't work alone. And the main point I want to make here is that we're here in part uh, spending our time actually communicating and collaborating in Israel in part because we know we can't do it alone and we rely heavily on research networks so we take our our strengths in building teams and world-class scientists and in mission-driven science to try to partner with other entities in particular uh, entities within Israel. Here's just an example of some of the types of major facilities we provide not just for our own staff but for the world through uh, competitive proposals uh, this is the Mira computer. It's a 10 petaflop uh, peak performance computer. It's the fourth fastest computer in the world. And the reason I show this is that, is that first of all, it, it's a major consumer of energy. It consumes seven megawatts of electricity, which is very impressive in its own. But it's there to solve major problems in energy and science, uh, for example, in trying to understand how to design a better battery. So these kinds of tools are critical for advancing the state and really understanding what's next. So what is next? What are the big questions that we ask at a place like Argonne, a multidisciplinary research facility really focused on this mission-driven science? And here's a few examples that in addition, of course, to the early work done in shale gas back in the 70s, these are today's important questions. What are the next technologies? Where will the new energy economy be driven? Uh, the first, of course, is pretty obvious, and Israel is, is, is in the forefront of this with companies like Better Places. How do we how do we really transform the transportation business? And it's not just a carbon footprint issue, it's an energy independence issue. How do we get to a battery that costs, let's say, one cent a mile, or that can power an automobile two or 300 uh, miles? In Israel, the distances maybe aren't as so far, but still a car that goes 40 miles is not yet transformative. A car that goes 400 miles is. So how do we design that battery? Those are the types of questions we're trying to answer here. How do we make solar electricity compete uh, from a price point of view with, uh, for example, natural gas. A nickel or five cents per kilowatt hour is not unusual to pay that in the U.S. today. How do we get solar electricity down to that price now? Solar electricity fully loaded with balance of, of plant, et cetera, is, is really more like 15 to 20 cents a kilowatt hour. Still not bad, but without any kind of uh, major policy changes, 
we need to still drive factors of three to four out of the cost. And so that's a science problem. How do we get, for example, the ultimate, which is how do we imitate a leaf? How do we get fuels from simple CO2, water, and sunlight at scale? Today, plants do this, of course, to survive, but are only about 0.01% efficient. How do we do something like this? This is a problem in catalysis. It's a problem in material science, and one the type of problem that we work on at National Labs and continue to be uh, driving forward. We're very far from a solution here. I'm betting 10 to 20 years, but that's an important problem. What about room temperature superconductors? I talked about the grid only very briefly, but, but uh, one area where room temperature super, or at least high temperature superconductors could play a major role are on wind turbines. Uh, basically, the, the amount of energy extracted from a wind turbine is now limited by the size of the, the blades in the turbine, so it's weight. But another part of that is the weight of the motor, and the motor can be made a factor of two lighter with superconducting cables. Uh, so can we invent uh, superconductors that actually operate at much higher temperatures, even in a dream like room temperature? And finally, uh, we talk about smart grid. Of course, the goal here is to monitor, sensorize, and really understand and control the grid at a level which we, today we call, control the internet. Can we do that? These are the kinds of problems that we're, questions we're asking here uh, at, at National Labs. So again, the grand, these are grand challenges, uh, and creating an artificial leaf is one of those challenges, but ultimately the future of energy technology will depend like on things like this, asking the big questions and driving the science and the technology, the long-term investment, just like in shale gas where 30, over 30, 40 years ago, there was large investment in an area where people felt there was no point in investing. Same thing today. Why invest in, for example, an artificial leaf at scale? Why well, think that we'll need to create all of our fuel from existing CO2 and sunlight and water? Uh, that's a good question, but that we need, to, uh, we need to address today. We need to start thinking about it today. Now, there's one other thing as I finish here that I want to remind everybody of, and that it takes time to make a difference, that things don't happen overnight. Uh, Energy has become front and center in many of the dialogues we have here in Israel, all over the world. Uh, and I, I'm also sometimes afraid that expectations get elevated to the same level of excitement that we feel for these types of, of developments across the world. But we do have to realize that we have to have some patience. However, the expectation clearly is that as inventions occur, uh, innovation follows very quickly. And this is just a chart that came from the New York Times. It's a little bit old now, but it shows you that over the years, going way back, uh, from you know, the, the adoption of electricity all the way through today to adoption of things like charge couple device or like cameras or like, uh, or like cell phones, uh, things are being adopted much, much faster. So the expectation is really accelerating. Uh, but I do want to remind you that, that many of these technologies take time and long-term investment. So today, you know, the, where is the game changing? It's changing here. Here's Keturah's son at the Kibbutz uh, Keturah. Uh, in Israel, uh, this is a five megawatt array for electricity, provides mostly electricity for this kibbutz. Uh, this is a start. This is where we're starting. Uh, the, the installation, I'm sure, is not a nickel per kilowatt hour. It's probably four or five times that. But we're moving in a direction where we're going to be able to take these types of arrays and power a much larger fraction of our needs uh, in, in the growing economies that we all, uh, we all share. Uh, and also here. So this is Argonne National Labs. I'm here representing DOE and the Argonne Labs. Uh, this is the multidisciplinary lab I talked about before. We're doing the kind of innovation to drive the cost of solar out to five cents a kilowatt hour, to create the new batteries that drive an automobile 400 miles or 500 kilometers, 600 kilometers. Uh, and these types of, of activities become ever more important as we look at the energy landscape and try to drive the future technologies. And finally, at meetings like this, at Elat Elot, it's a very important type of meeting to bring an international group together to really start uh, hammering away, not just, by the way, on the technology side, but also on the policy side. I don't have enough time to talk about that piece, but clearly policy plays a big role when you're trying to talk about how you introduce and rapidly adopt new technologies that don't look price competitive, but might be if the right types of incentives are introduced. So with that, I'll say thank you. Again, uh, sorry I couldn't be there. I'm delighted to have this few minutes uh, to, to address you on some of the things I think are important, and I look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you.